Good morning. My name is currently Godzilla. Everybody has to spawn somewhere, and in zombies we do it in areas known as spawn rooms. Every map has one, and so today we are going to take a trip through zombies history and review them all. Well, just Treyarch zombies history. They have enough maps as is, and I still haven't played all the non-Treyarch ones, but we can cover those in the sequel. Anyway, these spawn rooms are going to be judged based on things like how well they are integrated into their maps, what kind of role they play during a match, how well they introduce new mechanics, and most importantly, how much I like them. And while we're at it, we're going to attempt to answer the age-old question. What even is a spawn room? It all started at the start, with Alfred Hitchcock's Night of the Undead. This spawn room makes up roughly a third of the whole map, and naturally gets a lot of usage throughout a match. In fact, the high round strategy on all three versions of this map involved the spawn room to some extent. I really like the vast open area that is visible from the windows. You can see zombies slowly emerging from the fog and try to pick them off before they get close, which gives this map more of a tower defense feeling than any other map has. Many people would consider this to be a flaw, but I think it's great for setting up the atmosphere of this map, and it makes the starting weapons much more worthwhile to purchase. Now what I don't like so much about this spawn room is that, after a certain point, this area beyond the dotted line becomes a death trap and you will want to avoid it at all costs. This is somewhat remedied in the Black Ops version by putting Mule Kick in this corner. It's not like it takes all that long to buy the perk, but at least it's something to do in this area. But then the Black Ops 3 version sort of undercuts this by adding the Wonder Fizz machine on the other end of the building. Sure, you can't get Mule Kick from it, so you'd still have to go and buy it from the machine, but for most people, Mule Kick isn't a very high priority perk anyway. However, this version also has the Samantha Easter Egg, which largely takes place in this part of the spawn room, which kind of makes up for this. Overall, I do really like this spawn room. Picking off zombies in the distance during the early rounds is really fun, it's good for the high rounds in all three versions, and it is literally a big part of the map. Although in World at War, a good chunk of this room serves almost no purpose, so this version will get a 7 out of 10. For Black Ops 1 and 3, I'll bump it up to an 8 out of 10 for the inclusion of Mule Kick and the Samantha Easter Egg, which make better use of the whole space. Next up, Zombie Verrucked, which translates to Zombie Crazy. This map has two spawn rooms the American and the German side. Now, the young whippersnappers who have only played Chronicles won't know this, but on the original versions of the map, half of it had primarily American weaponry and the other half German weaponry, hence the names. The side you spawn on will be random and will have an effect on your experience, but in games of three or four players, you'll be split up between both rooms, which creates some good chaotic fun. Plus, the layout of this map is just a big circle, and due to the nature of circles, you'll be coming back to these rooms regularly. But now let's go ahead and get into each one, starting with the American side. This room's layout is pretty simple. It's mostly just a large, empty room with a small room on the front. In the early rounds, all the space in here makes it easier to survive, especially if the zombies break in, but in later rounds, you're never going to want to set foot in these areas again, especially the little room up front, because they're more likely to get you killed than anything. And with both doors being directly across from each other and quick revive right in between them, there's no real reason to go off to the sides anyway. Except for maybe one thing, the secret door. Well, I don't know if it's really meant to be a secret, but it took me a long time to notice it because it blends in so well. This door goes to nowhere. It's just a tiny little room with a bar wall by, or the bootlegger in Black Ops 3. It was probably meant to be a place to hold out in, but it's too small for this to be a viable strategy. Although it does work better in Black Ops 3 with Double Tap 2.0 and Gobble Gums, but it's still not something I see people doing all that often. This spawn room also has the disadvantage of being on the side with more doors to open, so you'd think that it'd be better to start off on the other side, especially in Solo, and in World at War that is certainly the case. But this is balanced out in Black Ops 1 and 3 because spawning in here gives you immediate access to Quick Revive. So, because each version of this spawn room is a little different, they're all going to get their own ratings. World at Wars is going to get a 3 out of 10. There's really nothing special about it, most of the space will go unused as the match goes on, and for Solo, it is the objectively worst side to spawn on. The Black Ops version is almost identical, but Quick Revive's Solo functionality does make spawning in here worth it, so it is going to get a 4 out of 10. Oh yeah. And the Springfield wall buy was replaced with a Car 98K, which does make me sad, but is not major enough to really hurt the rating. And the Black Ops 3 version is going to get a 5 out of 10, since camping in the secret room is easier with all the new mechanics, which may help you get more use out of the space. 
Now let's talk about its counterpart, the German side. This room is divided into several smaller sections, making it more close quarters than the American side so it's a little harder to survive in. But you're actually forced to use more of the space in here because Juggernaug is in the back, as opposed to being on the main path like Quick Revive in the other room, which may require some creative thinking if you need to buy it in the middle of a round. You've got a mystery box location in here too, which is yet another reason to come back here. The only part of it that's not really going to get used often is the little room up front. It's too small to play in in the later rounds, but in Black Ops 3 this is where you're going to find the Monty Radio, which does add a little bit of value to it. Also, the dentist area is probably the most iconic part of this map. It's seen again in Kino der Toten, and it's used on the Zombies Chronicles poster. I'm honestly kind of shocked that it didn't make it into Revelations. And of course, this side of the map does have less doors to open, which for Solo makes it the superior spawn room in World at War, but this is balanced out by the lack of Quick Revive in Black Ops 1 and 3. And fun fact, this is one of the few spawn rooms to have more than two wall weapons. There's the Gewer, the Car 98K, and the Frag Grenades. So for all three versions of this spawn room, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Very little space is wasted, and while it is the more challenging of the two to start in, it is placed on the easier side of the map. Now on to our fourth spawn room and our third map, Shinonuma, which doesn't translate into anything. And I'm just going to come right out and say it, this spawn room sucks. It's a high risk area, which isn't inherently a bad thing, but there's almost no reason to ever return to it after you leave. You may pass through it from time to time when you use the zip line or come up here for the mystery box, but with the doors being so close together, you won't be required to use a majority of the space. I also don't really like the visibility from these windows. Your view of the zombies is often obstructed, especially in this one where they have to come up the stairs, which is a little annoying when you're trying to shoot them. At least in the Black Ops version, they added Mule Kick in the corner by the Gewer, which does add a little bit of value to the room, and in Black Ops 3, they replaced it with Quick Revive, which is even better. The only other good thing I can think of about this spawn room is the Radio Easter Egg, which was the first major bit of lore that we got for the story, but still, this spawn room plays a very minor role in a match of Shinonuma, especially in World at War, so I'm only going to give it a 2 out of 10, but I will bump it up to a 4 out of 10 for Black Ops 3 because of the inclusion of Quick Revive. Now let's move on to the next map. Wa wa waffen waffen fabrik. You spawn in around the mainframe facing the Pack-a-Punch machine, ensuring that new players will not miss these features. And stepping up to the locked door will trigger a quote from your character which emphasizes just how important this new machine is. You will need to return to the spawn room at least three times to get all the teleporters linked, which will continue to send you back here each time you use one. And the layout of Deris basically pushes you towards the teleporters, encouraging you to run towards one, use it, return to spawn, and then run to another, continuing the cycle. It also helps that any zombies near the mainframe will die when you activate a teleporter, which ensures that you won't be taking any unfair downs for using this map's major feature. And each time you do, there's a chance for a drop to spawn on the far end of the room, which not only makes use of this space, but also forces players to decide whether or not they want to stick around for it, or get out of there immediately. The safer option is to leave before the zombies can reach you, but it could be a max ammo. But let's say that you're camping on the catwalk and not really using the teleporters. Well, you're still going to want to come back here from time to time so that you can upgrade your weapons. I also think that it was a great idea to put the Pack-a-Punch on a raised platform in the middle of the room. The elevated position does signify its importance, but more importantly, it makes it safer to use. Since there are only three points of access for the zombies, two of which require them to slowly crawl up the sides. The only real cons I can think of for this spawn room are these stairs and this alley that lead to two of the barricades. They're perfect fine for the early rounds, but beyond that you're never really going to go into them again. But that is pretty minor, not nearly enough to stop me from giving this spawn room a 10 out of 10. And those were the first four zombies maps from World at War. But before we move on, I think it would be a good idea to take a quick break and go over all the characteristics of a spawn room that we've seen so far. We can say that the spawn room is the area of the map where you spawn at the beginning of the game, confined by the borders of the map, purchasable doors costing between 750 to 1000 points, or doors that require power. There are 3 to 5 barricades for the zombies to enter, 2 or 3 wall weapons ranging from 200 to 600 points, and it may include a mystery box location and a perk machine, either with or without power, but these are not required. And you may be thinking, what about the Pack-a-Punch machine? It was in the Deris spawn room. Well, technically it was behind a powered door, so it was not part of spawn. Anyway, I think that's a good start for our definition of a spawn room, so let's go ahead and move on.
Like Deris, Keynote or Toten's spawn room contains the mainframe, but instead of three teleporters, there's just the one. And while the teleporter is still vital for accessing Pack-a-Punch, you won't be as reliant on it because this map is just a big figure eight, and you can run laps through it forever without ever getting trapped. But that's also the main reason that this spawn room stays relevant for the whole game. You're always going to loop back to it, unless of course you're running trains on the stage or in the alley. This is also probably why the teleporter needs to cool down and be relinked after each use, because it's expected that you'll be returning here on foot quite a bit. This spawn room also does a great job at utilizing its entire space, primarily because of the two doors, which are as far apart from each other as they could possibly be. There is also the door that connects to the theater, which is right next to the lower door, so technically you could use this route and skip most of the spawn room, but then you'd miss out on all the other utilities in here, like the mainframe and the quick revive. Speaking of which, Kino Der Toten started the trend of putting quick revive in spawn for solo players, which would ensure that most of the following spawn rooms would be at least a little relevant to their maps. They also put the machine in the perfect spot, right behind the bar, an area where nobody would go otherwise. This spawn room is also one of the best places to be during a fire sale because the mystery box on the top level is so close to the one in the next room, which allows you to hit both of them at the same time. I really can't think of anything bad to say about this spawn room. It gets a lot of usage throughout the game and effectively uses its entire space, so I am going to give this one a 10 out of 10. The spawn room for 5 is certainly fun to play in in the earlier rounds. The breakable windows make this map unique from others, and I like how only 4 of the 6 barriers in here will be active at a time, creating some variety in each match. I also like that they didn't zombify the room. The sterile office environment sets this map apart from others, and seeing the zombies in such a clean environment somehow makes them feel dirtier and more infectious. Plus, this room is home to one of the most iconic out-of-bounds glitches in Zombies history. But beyond those first few rounds, this area becomes pretty dangerous to be in. Not only because it's very cramped, but also because getting out of here can be difficult. There's the teleporter, which can be pretty easily blocked by the zombies, especially if they follow you through it. And if it is how you got here in the first place, then there will be a short cooldown before you can use it again, which gives the zombies even more opportunity to block it. The other way is to use the elevator out in the hallway, which is more reliable, but if it's not on that floor when you need it, waiting here with the zombies spawning everywhere could be a death sentence. Because of this, it's best to avoid this area completely unless you really need to come up here. And there is certainly stuff worth coming back for, like quick revive, speed cola, and a couple box spawns, but you're either going to want to come up in between rounds, or you're going to need to plan out your route in advance. Unless you're going for high rounds, in which case the only viable strategy is to run trains through the electric traps on this floor, but you'll still want the awful Lawton to keep yourself safe. And while we're on the topic of traps, let's add them to our list of spawn room criteria. A couple other things about this spawn room that bother me are how it gets darker when you turn on the power, which doesn't make any sense, and the intro cutscene does not take place in this room. It's actually in the Pack-a-Punch room. So I think I will give the 5 spawn room a 5 out of 10. No pun intended. It's unique, and it works well for the early rounds and the absurdly high rounds, but not so much for the ones in between. Ascension's spawn room is probably one of the most important rooms on the whole map. This is where the Lunar Lander will take you each time you use it, which you will need to do at least three times to open Pack-a-Punch. You're also able to take the Lunar Lander from spawn back to wherever it was, making this the first spawn room to have some kind of fast travel. So we can add a fast travel system to our list of characteristics that a spawn room can have. And no, the teleporter in 5 did not count because it was behind a powered door. You're able to defend Juggernaug and Quick Revive from here, two of the most important perks. In Black Ops 3, it's where the high round strategy takes place due to the AATs. The centrifuge is a cool feature, not only being a hazard to the players, but you could also use it as a trap. This map introduced a new zombie behavior of jumping really high, which is displayed in this spawn room, and coming down on the lander is a very cool way to start the match. It sure is a good thing that they found this thing at Keynote or Toten and that it had enough fuel to fly all the way to Russia. My only real issue with this room is that the monkeys can spawn in here. So if you want to effectively protect Juggernaug and Quick Revive, especially in solo, you always have to open the upper door, as going the other way will allow the monkeys to attack from two directions, making those rounds a lot harder. And also, I don't like that the monkeys can't jump down from the second level in Black Ops 3. It was funny to watch them get hit by the centrifuge. But other than that, this is still a pretty good spawn room, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it an 8 out of 10. Call of the Dead spawn is a circular room that's about half land, half water, with a little island across the pond where Quick Revive is located. Putting Quick Revive in this isolated spot was a great way to encourage players to venture out into the water and discover the freezing mechanic, and half the room being water makes it much easier for new players to figure out how George works when they inevitably shoot him. 
And it was also a great idea to spawn players facing the water, both to help them find Quick Revive in the first place, but also so that they'll see George coming out of the water. Now, this may not be the best area to spend a lot of time in due to the narrow bridge and the slow freezing water, but you can still get a lot of value out of this room later in the game. Whenever you're passing through, you can use the water to help manage the horde, since the zombies are also slowed by it. This also makes it a lot easier to grab Quick Revive in the middle of a round. Furthermore, it's a good area to shoot George in, since you can keep him calm in the water while you go back and forth between the two landmasses. There are also two additional ways to get back to this spawn room later in the game, the zip line from the top of the ship, and the path from the cargo bay that drops down into the water, which is very convenient when an angry Mr. Romero is chasing you. This spawn room also has seven spawn points for the zombies, which, if I've counted correctly, is the most that we've seen so far, but only one of them is a traditional barrier, one is a wall for them to climb over, and the rest are spots on the ground that they will dig out of. So we're going to have to update our definition of a spawn room. It can have three to seven spawn points, but it could be a mixture of barricades, climbable walls, and ground spawns. Also, like five, this intro cutscene does not take place in the spawn room. So I think I will give this one a seven out of 10. It's definitely not the best place to spend a lot of time in, but it's also not an area that you want to avoid either. It introduces a lot of the new mechanics pretty well, and it's a great place to deal with George. Shangri-La has an interesting spawn. It's basically a box within a box, with a path running straight to the middle and Quick Revive and the pressure plate for Pack-a-Punch right in the center. It's very close quarters, but thankfully the doors on each side contain a spike trap, which can be used to put some distance between you and the horde, or they could trap you or one of your teammates, which is kind of funny. Since this is another big circular map, players will naturally be returning to this area quite a bit, and normally you would just run straight through the center, but there are utilities in the front and back sides of this room that prevent them from being completely ignored. In the back, you've got a mystery box spawn and the geyser that provides quick access to the area below, or vice versa. And in the front is the temple where Pack-a-Punch is located, and it's also where the monkeys will run off to when they steal your drops. Additionally, this spawn room plays a major role in the map's main quest. It's where the four buttons are located to initiate Eclipse mode, which is how you start each step. It just sucks that you have to push all four at the same time for it to work. It would have been great if you could do it with less than four players. So I think the Shangri-La spawn room deserves a 7 out of 10. Sure, it's cramped and it's not the best area to play in, but the spike traps do help and there's still plenty to do in here. And it is vital for the main quest, but sadly only in matches with four players. Moon is weird. Does No Man's Land count as spawn? That's where you literally spawn, or does the receiving bay count as spawn? It has more of the characteristics of a spawn room. I'm inclined to say that it's the receiving bay, since that's where round one starts, and No Man's Land is more of a prelude to the map, which means that we're going to have to update our definition of a spawn room. It's not necessarily where you spawn at the beginning of the game, but rather where you spawn on round one. There are also no wall weapons in here, and it has the fewest amount of spawn points that we've seen so far with just two, so we're going to need to include that as well. So, how does the receiving bay do as a spawn room? Well, it's basically just an empty rectangular room with the PES station in the center, which initially seems kind of boring, but I think it was very specifically designed this way to be really easy for new players to find the PES before they suffocate. It's also the first thing that you see when you get here, which also helps. There are two doors to exit the room, but they function as one since they both lead to the same area, and when the power is turned on, a panel in the ground will open, providing another way in and out, although that applies for the zombies as well. You can also get back to this room pretty quickly from the far end of the map thanks to the teleporter, which is really helpful when an excavator is approaching. I've also always liked how you had to face the wall when you hack an excavator, which makes the process pretty tense when you can hear the zombies coming up behind you. There's a box spawn in here, one of two that has oxygen, making it one of the more favorable ones, especially when you're doing the Easter egg and trying to get all the weapons. And speaking of the Easter egg, this is also where you're going to find Richthofen's computer. The room is pretty spacious too. In Black Ops 1, it's actually where people run trains for the high round strategy. However, you're probably not going to want to spend too much time here in a casual game, not because of the receiving bay itself, but more because of the whole map's layout. The rooms between spawn and the teleporter are tight, high-risk areas, and if you go down you aren't going to want to go through these without perks, especially Juggernaug. So even though the receiving bay is an important room, and a survivable one, it's too isolated from everything else to be a comfortable place to stay for most people. And so for that, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Transit starts off in the bus station, which is very logical for a map built around the bus. And it's pretty neat that you can see the bus coming off of Route B to pick us up. This is easily one of the smallest spawn rooms, but it's perfect because its primary goal is to introduce the new crafting mechanic. 
All three parts for the turbine can easily be found in here and then assembled at the conveniently located workstation. You're then going to put the turbine down to see what it does, probably somewhere close to the workbench, which will be close enough to open up the power door on the side, letting you out for free and demonstrating just how beneficial this new mechanic can be. It's all very well done, and we're also going to have to add buildable parts and workbenches to our list of spawn room characteristics. There are also four extra zombies sleeping in this room at the beginning of the match, which I guess counts as a type of spawn point. This does technically introduce the sleeping mechanic, but it's such a minor feature that I don't think it really needed an introduction. Maybe the point of them is to show that the apocalypse has been going on for so long that the zombies are just chilling. But then, what are the characters doing in here with them? I thought they all met on the bus, how did they get locked in here? Can somebody please explain transit lore to me? I've also always been fond of this one window in the back where the zombies walk up from real far away. I just think it's kind of cool to get to shoot at them in the distance. So this spawn room is sounding pretty good so far, right? Well, the problem with it is that once you leave, you're rarely going to come back to it. Maybe to buy Quick Revive or to get a new turbine, but that's it. Its small size, which was great for introducing the buildables, makes it nearly impossible to survive in, and there's only one reliable way in and out, making it very easy to get trapped in here. And then, to make matters worse, after a few rounds the ground will crack apart and fire will appear, making it even more dangerous. This would have been a cool feature if it could have happened anywhere around the map, but for some reason it is specific to the spawn room. It's like Treyarch really doesn't want you to come back here. So all in all, I think this spawn room deserves a 7 out of 10. I would consider it to be perfect for the early rounds, but it's just not a good idea to come back here later on. Now, are the survival maps worth including? They break a lot of the established rules, but they are still official maps, so I guess we'll go over them. Bus Depot's spawn room is the same as Transit's, but worse. There's no quick revive, no buildable, no sleeping zombies, it adds nothing to the game. For that reason, I'm going to give it a 1 out of 10. It plays well enough in the early rounds, but that's about it. The spawn room for Farm is the whole map, except for the house, which I think is just too much. It would have been better if there were more doors to break things up, Maybe one for the barn and one for the shed? That way you would have had to work towards Double Tap and the Galvan Knuckles instead of having access to them immediately. But that's not what they did, and because of this we need to update our definition of a spawn room. Farm has established that there could be two perks in a spawn room, and that the price of a starting weapon can be as high as 6,000 points. So I think I'll give this one a 4 out of 10. It's mostly just average, not doing anything particularly well or poorly. I just wish it had been divided up into smaller segments for us to open. The spawn room for town is also a majority of the map, but it works out a lot better this time because there are actually more areas to open, which makes it feel more like the central point of the map rather than the whole thing. And the design of it is consistent throughout. There are no areas that feel like they could have been different rooms, it's all just the streets of the town. I would also say that everything in here was distributed really well. Every section of this room has something to offer, whether it be weapons, perks, playable space, or just access to different areas. Except for the area next to the bar, that one they didn't really do much with. And then, right in the center is Pack-a-Punch, probably in its most iconic location. Honestly, I sometimes forget that this isn't where it is on transit, and then I get sad when I remember all that bunker nonsense. But the inclusion of Pack-a-Punch means that we'll have to add it onto our definition of a spawn room. And we can also say that a spawn room can have up to three perks due to Stamina Up, Double Tap, and in co-op games, Tombstone being in here. And for the first time, the mystery box can initially be in spawn. I'm also pretty sure that there are more than seven zombie spawn points, but it's getting too hard to count, and it's only going to get worse from here, so I'm not going to worry too much about the exact number. Now I'm going to give Town's spawn room a 9 out of 10. It could have easily been a 10 out of 10, but they just didn't really do anything with the space next to the bar. Nuketown Zombies is technically still a survival map, but it plays more like a mainline map with similar progression, easter eggs, new features, and stuff like that. But there was an issue. Treyarch chose the center of the map to be spawn, which was the best option because it makes the map symmetrical, but it's also too big of an area to have all the restrictions of a normal spawn room, so they had to find some ways to work around this. Firstly, with the wall weapons. There's a total of 11 wall buys on this map, the same number as Transit even though it's only a fraction of the size. The M14 and the Olympia obviously go in spawn, so that leaves 9 more to spread out around the houses, which would have been a lot. And it's an uneven number. So they put 4 of them in the houses, and then shoved the rest inside the moving van and locked it behind a 3000 point door. The most expensive door that we've seen so far. Sure, they're still densely packed together, but at least in the moving van it works as sort of a joke. 
but what this really does is let them put more guns in spawn without letting players access them right away. Next was Perks and Pack-a-Punch. Sure, they could have just distributed these around the map, but it's so small that you'd be able to get set up really fast, which would have been kind of boring. So instead, the Perk and Pack-a-Punch machines will drop into the map across 10 possible locations, four of which can be found in spawn. And with the right RNG, you could have four of these machines land in spawn, so we will have to update our definition of a spawn room to include up to four perks. However, this only applies to co-op games. In a solo match of Nuketown Zombies, Quick Revive is guaranteed to appear on round one in spawn, which was very nice of Treyarch to do, but no other machines will land in here for the duration of the match. Another small detail I really like about this spawn room is the garage on the greenhouse, which requires you to crawl inside. It's a silly little thing that didn't need to be included, but I'm glad that it was. Plus, one of the perk spawns is in here, which can make for a really chaotic match if something like Juggernaug were to land in here. But despite the size of the spawn room, players will mostly gravitate towards the backyards, and only really go back to spawn whenever they need to. Which, to be fair, may be a lot depending on the random drops, but still. So this map spawn room is going to get two ratings. For solo, because it can only have quick revive, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10, but for co-op, because any of the perks and pack-a-punch could drop in here, the room has the potential to be way more valuable, so I will raise the rating to an 8 out of 10. Right off the bat, the Die Rise spawn room gets some points for picking up right where the cutscene ends, but then it loses some points because you spawn facing the wrong way, but then it gets some back for showing off that skybox. Like Transit, there are two exits to this room, the regular, purchasable door, and the free route, in this case an elevator that falls to the lower floor of the building when you stand in it. And already we must return to our definition of a spawn room. This elevator isn't really a door, but I don't think this area below should be counted as part of spawn, so I think we're going to need to add a new characteristic to further define the edges of a spawn room. Perhaps something like a one-way route. Something that will let you out of the room, possibly even for free, but does not let you back. Anyway, if every player steps into the elevator, it will take you down to the key room, which is also near the bank, weapon storage, the power room, the Sliquifier's crafting station, and possibly Juggernaut 2 depending on the random perk spawns. So why not always use this route instead of the longer, more expensive one? Well, first of all, this is the first main map since Kino Der Toten that does not have Quick Revive in spawn. So if you want it in solo, you at least have to open that first door. Then once you've spent some points opening that first door, you might as well open the rest. Sunk cost fallacy, right? But for co-op where Quick Revive isn't necessary that early, what's the incentive to go this way? The answer is the guns. The mystery box and a majority of the wall weapons, including all of the new fancy ones, can only be found on this half of the map. So both routes are equally viable and each one offers a very different experience, which I really like. However, this is also a spawn room that you're not really going to come back to later in the game. It's just too far off the main path and there's not much of value that's worth coming back for. Just some of the pieces of the trample steam and one of the easter egg steps takes place in here, but beyond that there's nothing. You hardly even need to come back to this whole floor since quick revive can be accessed in more convenient locations below. So I think I'll give this one a 6 out of 10. The exit that you and your team choose to take will greatly affect how your match will play out, more so than any other map, but beyond that initial decision this spawn room doesn't have much else going on. Mob of the Dead's spawn room is made up of solitary confinement and the library, which, like the rest of the map, is very faithful to the original version. But the issue with the spawn room being so faithful is that it's not a very playable space. It's long and narrow, with a choke point on each side that makes getting in and out risky, so it's best to stay out of here. Actually, it's pretty easy to avoid altogether because it's so separate from the rest of the map. And it really doesn't help that Quick Revive is totally absent from this map, which removes any reason that there may have been to come back here. But, at the same time, you can't avoid this room. At least, not entirely. Because whenever you come back from the Golden Gate Bridge, you're going to respawn right back in here. You're still immediately going to leave before too many zombies can spawn in, but at least the room is getting used a little. It also does a really good job at introducing the map's new mechanics, mainly Afterlife. You start off in afterlife mode facing your body, which teaches players how they could use it to revive themselves, but more observant players will notice that there is also a spirit door on the side here, which contains a power box. This will encourage them to figure out how to interact with it, which will show them how power works on this map, and then if they see that the doorway is gone outside of afterlife, then they will see how it will be necessary to gain access to some parts of the prison. There's also a fuse box to find, which will help new players understand how to get back into afterlife mode. And while it's not the most obvious thing in the room, there is also a map of the prison with all the plane parts marked, which is an organic way of presenting this map's main objective. So even though this is a spawn room that you won't really return to voluntarily, you'll still get some use out of it each time you come back from the Golden Gate Bridge, and it excels at introducing new gameplay and narrative elements, so I'll give it a 7 out of 10. 
buried. I'm glad that we already established the whole one-way route thing when we did Die Rise, because the only way out of the buried spawn room is by jumping down a hole, and this whole underground area definitely shouldn't count as spawn. But because of this one-way route, the buried spawn room becomes completely inaccessible once you leave. There's a teleporter in the maze that'll take you back to this building, but it's not the same part of the building. Normally this is something that I would criticize, but there's something about this spawn room that makes it completely forgivable. The LSAT Wallby available for 2,000 points. This gives players a reason to stick around and actually get some use out of the room instead of just jumping down right away, but actually acquiring the gun isn't that easy. The room is a narrow crescent shape, which makes it very easy for the zombies to overwhelm you, plus the limited selection of weapons and the lack of quick revive and solo only makes this harder. Also, it's only accessible by jumping up onto this decrepit platform, so even if you do build up enough points, you may still miss the opportunity to get the gun if you don't make the jump, or if you're too slow and the platform collapses. So yes, this spawn room cannot be used again after you leave, but Treyarch took advantage of this by adding the LSAT wall by, which gives players a fun little challenge to go for and adds a lot more value to the room than there would have been otherwise. So I am going to give it a 10 out of 10. Like Die Rise, the Origins spawn room picks up right where the cutscene leaves off, which is something I will always appreciate, and I also enjoy the implication that, if you're not in a four-player match, the characters that are absent were crushed by the robots. I... I am alive! I like that the Ballista is available as a wall gun. It's cool to get some variety in the starting weapons, and a bolt-action rifle for the World War I-themed map is very appropriate. Although I do wish that it had replaced the M14 instead of the Olympia. And of course, this does not apply for the Black Ops 3 version, which still uses the standard Shiva and RK5 combo like every other map. This is also the map that started the trend of lowering the prices of doors in solo. Now the first door would only cost 500 points, the same amount that you start with. So you could choose to immediately leave spawn, but most people are still going to pick Quick Revive or maybe even a wall gun before that, which will keep them around a little longer. This spawn room also does a pretty good job at staying relevant throughout a match, especially considering it's in a more high-risk area, mostly thanks to Generator 1, which needs to be defended, but also serves to teach new players how the power works. There's also one of the reward boxes, Quick Revive, a switch for the Lightning Staff upgrade, and a location for the Mystery Box and Wonder Fizz. But my biggest problem with this spawn room is how everything is distributed. It's divided into two parts, the upper and lower levels, and most of the stuff that I just mentioned is on the upper level. All that's really down there are a shovel, Maxis's brain, and the electrical switch, all of which are interacted with once and can be done at the start of the match, as well as the mystery box and wonder fizz locations, which may have an impact on your game depending on how you play, but I personally don't use either of these enough for them to move down here. It also doesn't help that both of the doors are up here as well, so you can enter this room, do whatever you need to do, and leave without really needing to touch the lower level at all. I also don't really like that two of the shovels are guaranteed to be here in spawn. I mean, it works out in a three or four player game, since not everyone can get one right away, but I wish that there was a chance for only one to spawn here, or even no shovels. That would have created some extra variety between matches. So overall, I think this spawn room deserves a 5 out of 10, primarily because half of it is very forgettable, at least for Black Ops. Two. For Black Ops 3, I'll give it a 4 out of 10 because it does not have the unique weapons. Shadows of Evil and Mob of the Dead are two maps with a lot in common, and that extends to their spawn rooms as well. Much like the introduction to Afterlife, Shadows does a great job at establishing beast mode. You don't start off in it, but when you spawn, there is a very noticeable fountain with a purple flame in your line of sight that you're going to want to check out, which is how you will learn to become the beast. You can then immediately start testing out your new abilities. There's a power box connected to Quick Revive, which will be familiar to those who have played Mob of the Dead, but for new players, this will show them how power works. There are two breakable objects, a door with a drop behind it, and the box with the summoning key, which I would say was put in the perfect spot, right in between where you spawn and the door, which makes it pretty hard to miss when you inevitably look in this direction. The only thing that's missing in here is a spot to grapple, but at least you will get the chance to experiment with it in the first room. I also really like how, if you open that first door, you can do everything that there is to do in this area with just one use of beast mode. Within this room you can find a fumigator, which serves a very similar purpose as the shovels on Origins. I couldn't find exact numbers, but it looks like there will always be at least one in here, but I do like that it can be in multiple locations so that you actually have to look for it. There is also a map with all the sacrifice locations, much like the map with all the plane parts from Mob of the Dead, 
but they put it in the far corner of the room, and it's hidden behind a truck, so it's not very noticeable. I even forgot that it was here until I started making this video. There's a neat easter egg that lets you skip up to round 15 by shooting the Shadow Man, and it does directly connect with the end of the intro cutscene, which at this point had become standard. And I like that Quick Revive is actually present on this map instead of being replaced with Beast Mode, which gives players a reason to voluntarily return to spawn, and it's right in the middle of the room so you can't just walk in and out real quick, unlike the plant that's right by the door. But other than that, this isn't a spawn room that'll get much use later in the game. The only other part of the map it connects with is Nero's room, but the only reason to go back there after doing the sacrifice is to upgrade the sword if you're playing as Nero. So with that in mind, I will give this spawn room a 6 out of 10. It does do a lot right early on, but it just doesn't contribute much to the map later in the game, especially if you're not playing as Nero. The giant spawn room is identical to the Deer East spawn room, but with a couple of new details that warrant its own rating. First, the sixth perk easter egg, which is done by activating each teleporter with a monkey bomb inside, and then pushing this button next to the mainframe. It adds just one more thing to do in this room, and there's a cool light show that you get to watch. The second thing is the high round strategy, which involves running trains in here, something that wasn't really viable in previous versions due to the lack of alternate ammo types. So this spawn room is still a 10 out of 10, just a better 10 out of 10. Der Eisendrache I always thought it would have been so much cooler if Dare Eisendraha started you off riding in the tram, kind of like coming down in the lander on Ascension, but then there would be no guarantee that you'd be looking the right way to see the rocket launch, which is the basis for this whole map's storyline, so I can understand why they didn't do this. It's also worth noting that the view from this room is very cool, and I really like that you can see the robot from the cutscene down below. When you turn around, you'll see the new tram fuse power up, although in order to use it, you're going to have to walk all the way around this railing to reach the console, so it may not be immediately clear to new players what they're supposed to do with it. I think that the same can also be said for the landing pads. Sure, if you walk over it, you'll get the prompt to interact with it, but if not, then it's sort of just a gray circle on the ground that can easily be missed. I even still forget about it sometimes. But other than that, the spawn room isn't bad. It's not like you'll spend a ton of time in here, but there's a lot of space and it connects with four different areas, so you'll probably pass through it quite a bit during a match. Especially whenever you need Juggernaug, which is in this little gated room right in the back. Of course, there are the tram fuses to bring back here for some extra rewards, but they're usually pretty underwhelming, so it's easy to forget about this feature. Plus, waiting around for the gondola to arrive and then stepping into its tiny space could be dangerous on the higher rounds. The second gondola easter egg could have really helped with this, but apparently you have to throw some grenades into it at the start of the match, otherwise it won't work, which most players aren't going to know about. I think it would have been better if there was just a low chance of it coming up each time you put in a fuse. During the main quest, the wisp can potentially be in here, so you'll need to check this room several times for that. And there is also a high round strategy that involves camping by quick revive with the lightning bow, although there are other strategies that are better. So I will give this spawn room a 9 out of 10. It gets a good amount of use throughout a match, and there's plenty of spectacle to see, but it could have done a slightly better job of introducing its new features. And the tram fuse could have had a more significant role. In Zetsubo no Shima, you spawn standing in the water on the shore. It really gives off some I just washed up on a spooky beach vibes. The room is long and narrow, and your only option is to go forward, deeper into the island. Within this room, you can find one of the four buckets partially filled with water. It can be in a couple different locations, so you will have to look for it, but fortunately it glows blue, which makes it much easier to see on this dark map. Since there are some ground spawns for the zombies, there's a very good chance that you'll get a seed drop on round one, and a planter can be found on the far side of the room, which is everything you need to start a farm, but not enough to grow anything super valuable. You could argue that the planter might be hard for new players to find, but it doesn't really matter which one you use, and there are so many around the map that you're bound to find one eventually. The gobblegum machine will be covered in webs, which you must cut off in order to use, which both establishes that you can cut through webs, but also hints at the kind of enemies that you'll be seeing later on. There's a map in here that shows where everything is and also hints at how to open the bunker. You can also find one of the pedestals for the cleansing rituals here in spawn, the purpose of which won't be immediately clear, but having seen it before you find the altar will help you make the connection between the two and make it easier to figure out how to get the skull of non Sapwe. And thankfully they put this pedestal down by the water, which makes some use of this area beyond the first few rounds, because other than that, this spawn room is mostly wasted space. It is in between two major parts of the map, but the doors are pretty close together and anything of value is right between the doors, which minimizes the time that you would need to spend in here. They didn't even put Quick Revive in this room. So I'm going to give this one a 2 out of 10. It has a good start, and it does a fine job at introducing the new mechanics, but 90% of the room will be abandoned for the majority of the match. Oh god, Gorak Groby. Where do I even start? 
Well, this spawn room is incredibly unwelcoming, the space is limited so surviving in here is nearly impossible in higher rounds, and it doesn't help that there's only one door, so it's really easy to get stuck in here. You also have to go through the department store to get to and from the spawn room, which makes it feel very isolated from the rest of the map. But thankfully there is a second way to get back here. Leaving the Pack-a-Punch building will deposit you back in spawn, albeit right next to the exit so that you can get out immediately. And Quick Revive is here too so that you can easily buy it in the few seconds that you spend here. Obviously if you were put in the back by the fountain, or if Quick Revive were back there, it would have utilized more of the space in this room, but it also would have given the zombies plenty of time to clog up the narrow spaces, which would have led to some unfair deaths. Now you may be thinking, this spawn room doesn't sound great but it's certainly not the worst one that we've seen. Well, it gets worse. The biggest issue with this spawn room is how it tries to be way more important to the map than its design allows. There are quite a few little details and easter eggs in this room, but a lot of the more major mechanics are in here as well, such as the challenge tombstone. The feature itself is great, but they put this thing in a terrible spot, in a small little section of the room with small little entrances on each side, making it super easy to get trapped in here when you try to redeem your challenges, or obtain the gauntlets, or upgrade the monkey bombs. The same can also be said for trying to upgrade the shield. Putting it in the dragon's corpse can be pretty risky, especially considering it leaves you unprotected. You've also got a couple easter egg steps to do in here as well. You gotta send Nikolai the power core from the back of the room, and this is also where the Valkyrie escort step starts. Now for most of this stuff, you can just come here at the end of the round to make things easier. It'll be a little annoying because of how far away this room is, but it's better than death. Except for the Valkyrie Escort, which will always have zombies spawning in, making this step incredibly frustrating, especially for Solo. There is an electric trap in this room's door, which I guess is kind of neat, but I also don't know what good it does. It's not like this is a good area to group up a bunch of zombies to run through the trap, and using it while you're inside is just going to trap you in this terrible place. I also don't really like how hard it is to see Nikolai. It makes him feel very distant, like he's not really here with us, even though the whole easter egg is about helping him get the power core. And this one's more of a nitpick, but why is the spawn room named Belinsky Square? As far as I can tell, it's not based on a real place, so how did Nikolai get this named after him? Can somebody please explain Gorod Krovi lore to me? Although there is one good thing to mention about this spawn room. There's the Richard Rodriguez street sign, which is named after the person that won that Be A Zombie contest. But I'm still going to give this spawn room a 2 out of 10. Sure, you will come back to it a lot, and there is plenty to do in here, but the layout and location of the room just don't justify how significant it tries to be. Right off the bat, Revelations does two things right. First, you get a clear view of the Apothecan swallowing the Pack-a-Punch machine, which sets up your objective of getting it back. How exactly you're going to do this isn't clear, but at least you know where it is. The second thing is spawning you on one side of the room, facing the other, so that you can see the corruption engine. Sort of directing you over here so that you can figure out how the power works. This spawn room is pretty spacious too, which makes it a pretty safe place to run trains. Not mindlessly easy, like some areas, but comfortable. Especially with this map's wonder weapons. It also helps that the three points of entry, those being two jump pads and the teleporter, will get you in and out of here safely so long as you can get to them. I like that the house, which is a pretty big deal in the story, is visible from this room. Although I think it would have been better if you spawned right on the doorstep like at the end of the cutscene, but I can forgive this because you get to go into the house for the easter egg, and you can look out the window to see spawn. And speaking of the easter egg, this is where you're going to find the tombstones, one of the bones, one of the eggs, and one of the symbols. There's also one of the lanterns that plays dialogue from Dr. Monty or the Shadow Man, the wisp for the upgraded weapons easter egg can be found in here, and all of the crystals for upgrading the Apothecan Servant can be shot from here as well if you know where to look. This is also the only Black Ops 3 map that has a mystery box location in spawn, which can really help to get a head start on this easter egg if you're running Immolation Liquidation, since there are no free Wonder Weapon side quests. Overall, this room is very important to the map, it's a pretty safe area to play in, and none of the space is wasted, so I think it deserves a 10 out of 10. Voyage of Despair starts off on the accurately recreated deck of the Titanic, where you will be presented with the sight of the iceberg colliding with the ship, which is such a good way to start this map. The area itself is also rather spacious, definitely more so than the interior of the ship, which is nice whenever you're passing through this area, whether it be from just using the fast travel portal, or if you're just trying to get to the cargo bay. And I don't know what this thing is, but I like that it gets blown up when you acquire the Sentinel Artifact, making it much easier to access this area below. It's also kind of neat that they included this map that shows where the box is, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell which route it's on. But as the first map of Black Ops 4, Voyage of Despair started a trend that I'm not super fond of. Remember, since Origins, the price of the first door in Solo has been 500 points. Cheap enough to open right away, but there were other things to buy first. 
In Black Ops 4, these things are gone. You start off with two free self-revives and you can equip any of the starting guns in your loadout. So for a lot of the maps from here on out, there's really no reason to stay in the spawn room in solo. Although Voyage of Despair does kind of remedy this by including the Danu perk statue, perks don't need to be powered on Chaos maps, so if you want to, you could save up your points and buy whatever it is that you put in this perk slot before moving on, both in solo and co-op. So I think this spawn room deserves a 7 out of 10. It's a relatively spacious and survivable area, and you are likely to return here multiple times in a match, and the inclusion of the Danu perk statue does give you something to do in here before you leave. On 9, you spawn in a dark tunnel, listening to the chants from the audience above. The only light is from the gate ahead, which opens to let you out. And with no other options, you go forward, into the arena. You'll get a second to observe your surroundings as the crowd cheers, but then the music will pick up and the zombies begin to flood into the arena. It doesn't line up with the map's cutscene, but it is an awesome way to start a match. However, there is a problem. The gate that you just walked through will close behind you, preventing you from going back. And one of the characteristics of a spawn room that we came up with earlier was having a one-way route that doesn't let you go back. Well, technically you can go back so long as someone is still in there to keep it open, but I'm still considering this a one-way route because not everybody can freely travel in and out. We can't remove this characteristic, otherwise all of this would have to be considered part of spawn on Die Rise, as well as all of this on Buried. And we also can't exclude this area like we did with No Man's Land on Moon, because round one does start while you're in here. So, based on previously established criteria, the spawn room for 9 is just this tunnel, not the whole arena. Which sucks, because I really do like the arena, and I would have given it a 10 out of 10. The only thing we have to do is remove the requirement for zombie spawn points, because there are none in this tunnel. Instead, they have to spawn in the arena and walk over here. I thought that camping in here might be a fun strategy, since the zombies can only come from one direction and you would have to work with your team to keep the room open, but you can't actually stay in here after round 8 because the gas from the special rounds will mess you up. Maybe it would work in custom mutations if you turn them off. Nope. So yeah, it makes for a spectacular introduction to the map. Camping in here is kinda fun while it lasts, and I do like how special enemies will use this tunnel to enter the map throughout the game but this spawn room is only going to get a 3 out of 10. When you watch the Blood of the Dead intro, you would think that you're going to start the match on the docks and have to work your way back to Richthofen's lab, but that is not the case. You still spawn in Richthofen's lab, and basically repeat what you just watched the characters do, but they still talk about things that happened in the cutscene. Richthofen knew exactly who that monster in cell block was. So everything feels very incoherent, which is not a good way to start a map. But in terms of gameplay, this spawn room is just fine. It's too small to play in mid-round, but the room does play a pretty big part in the main quest, so you will be returning to it a few times for that. There is also nothing to stop you from opening the first door right away in solo, unless you're a story nerd like me and want to take a look around. There is some pretty cool stuff to see in here, like Victus and the Cryopods, and if you interact with them as Richthofen, Stuhlinger will talk to you during the main quest, which is a really cool detail. There's a callback to Edward's Walnut Delivery, which is also part of the free Monkey Bomb Easter Egg, and there's a very nice view of the prison from the upper level. I also really like that one of the guns is the RK-7, which costs 700 points instead of 500. It's the first time since Black Ops 1 that we've seen any sort of variety with the prices of the starting weapons, although you can still spawn with it for free anyway, so it's not going to have that much of an effect on the game, but at least it's there. So I'll give this spawn room a 5 out of 10. It's a really cool environment and it's pretty significant to the main quest, but I still think that we should have spawned on the docks and had to work our way back. As a remake of 5, the classified spawn room is almost identical to the older maps, but there are enough differences to rate it separately. Unlike the original, there are now two ways out of here instead of just one. There's the original path that goes out into the hallway with the elevator, and then the new one which goes around the back of the spawn room and leads to the same hallway with the elevator. But despite just being a longer route to the same destination, this path can actually still be worth taking because there are craftable parts in each of the new rooms. So there's a little more early game variety than there was with 5. Additionally, these new rooms make the whole upper floor, and by extension the spawn room, much safer to play in because they create a circuit, which removes the dead ends that originally made this area so dangerous. And there's also a new teleporter that makes it easier to get out of here. However, there are a few new issues with this spawn room. The area is a lot messier than 5, which means that the breakable windows are now gone. Not that it's a huge deal, but I do miss them. Takio also refers to this environment as sterile, which would have worked on 5, but is strange here because there's nothing sterile about this place. And the cutscene shows that the characters have been in the Pentagon for a while before the zombie outbreak, but when the match starts they speak as if they just arrived. However, I don't think this cutscene is meant to be taken as seriously as others, so I'm not going to count this against it. At least it doesn't get darker in here when you turn on the power. So this spawn room is going to get a 6 out of 10. 
I do have some minor issues with it, but because it's a little safer to be in than the 5 spawn room, it's going to get a slightly higher rating. Like Verruckt, Dead of the Night has two spawn rooms. You can spawn in either one, and teams of three or four will be split between them. But Dead of the Night makes a couple mistakes that ruin the effect. Firstly, the doors are linked. If the players on one side open a door, the corresponding door on the other side will open as well. So even though you're physically separated, you don't really feel separated. But worse than that is that there are only two doors that need to be opened to reunite the team, which should only take two or three rounds to do at most with the linked doors. It could even be done on round one with a little bit of coordination. This gimmick just doesn't last long enough to have any major impact on the map, which is a real shame because I loved it on Verruckt. But it's not all bad with these spawn rooms. I like that the first shield part could spawn on either side, or possibly by the sentinel artifact, so both teams have to be looking for it. And I do appreciate how the weapons are different on each side, just like for Rukt. Although, they're all guns that you can spawn with, so it won't really matter for most people. So I'm gonna give both of these spawn rooms a rating of 2 out of 10. They do a couple things well, but ultimately Treyarch just didn't do enough with it. In Ancient Evil, you spawn in the Temple of Apollo. And the first thing you are going to notice is the sleeping zombies, just like we saw on Transit. Although, unlike Transit, these ones will wake up no matter what you do. Their inclusion feels much more appropriate this time around, since all the zombies in the intro cutscene are shown to be in this idle state. However, they do wake up at the end, so it's a little weird that they've gone back to sleep when the match starts. But that's kind of all there is about this spawn room that makes it special. I mean, yeah, the oracle's here too, but she's not doing much. At least at the start of the match. When you get the Sentinel Artifact, you can start doing the Tributes, something that plays a pretty major role on this map, particularly for the Easter Egg. You can accept these challenges in both the Temple and the Cliff Ruins, but the Temple is the more convenient location. It's the central point of this part of the map, making it pretty easy to get back to, and this area is easier to survive in. It also helps that you can only redeem the rewards from here. And there are some good high round strategies that you can do in here as well. Honestly, I can't really think of anything bad to say about this spawn room, but it's not like it's an outstanding spawn room either. It serves its purpose, so I think I will give it a 6 out of 10. Alpha Omega's spawn room is very similar to the one from 9, just less dramatic. It's a tiny little area that exists mainly to introduce the map, but because there's a one-way route, only the security checkpoint can be considered the spawn. It is cool to walk under this Welcome to Camp Edward sign, and you do get a really nice view of the map, as well as the surrounding desert, which makes it feel much more isolated than the original Nuketown Zombies. But that's really all there is to it. Although unlike 9, this room is an actual playable area. I mean, there's an achievement for surviving 20 rounds in here, something that was not possible on 9, and it even has its own name. But I wish that this room had an expensive wall buy or something, kinda like Buried, because other than that achievement, there's really no incentive to spend any time in here. So I'm just going to give this spawn room a 2 out of 10. It's basically just a more playable version of 9 spawn room, but there's also no incentive to actually use it. On Togdor Toten, you spawn on the docks behind the lighthouse, an area that was actually visible on Call of the Dead. Well, technically you spawn on a pile of snow across from the docks, but you know what I mean. It's a mixture of snowy piles and wooden docks that make up this room, with freezing water in the gaps between. To get around quickly, you have to jump between these little bits of land, but if you fall into the water, you can't always jump right back out, which is a neat little hazard. There are two things of note in this spawn room. The first is the power switch, the first of three on this map. It was always a little weird that the one power switch on Call of the Dead could power everything, so it makes sense to add another one. Although, I feel like there were better places that it could have been, like in the lighthouse, because then you would have had to actually go out into the map and find it rather than just flipping it right away. The other thing in here is the shield part, which gives you a reason to explore this room a little bit before you leave, especially in solo. Although I never really find myself coming back to this room very often, even with the added zip lines connecting it to the lighthouse and the facility, it's kind of out of the way and it doesn't play a very significant role during the main quest other than a couple minor things, so I'm gonna go ahead and give it a 6 out of 10. The first map of the Dark Aether Saga, D Machina, spawns you in a wide open area behind the Nocturon Totem building, with trees, debris, and a tank scattered around the room. Because of this layout, it's pretty easy to survive in here, which does make the Entomophobia achievement relatively easy to unlock. But I also think that this layout makes it kind of boring for the early rounds. There are quite a few zombie spawn points that aren't very clearly marked and are spread out across this large room, and I feel like I spend a lot of my time running around in circles looking for them. And you could say that this was also the case on maps like Town and Nuketown, maybe even worse, but at least the geography on those maps was more engaging. D Machina is just a flat open area, and I think it's a little weird that you start off facing the building, but most of the zombies spawn behind you outside of your field of view. 
There is also literally nothing to do in here in solo. The doors are still 500 points, but there is nothing else to spend those points on or to interact with at the start of the match, so you might as well just open them right away. I mean, sure, there is the rampage inducer, but that only takes like two seconds to use. And I guess you could try to craft some stuff before you go, but who would do that? It'll take a while to collect enough salvage, and there will be plenty of opportunities to do so later. But after those early rounds, this spawn room plays just fine. There are initially two ways out of here, but once the power is on, a third door in the back will open, connecting spawn with the bunker below. This turns the map into a big circuit and increases the amount of traffic going through here. The placement of these doors also helps to utilize the most amount of space in this room. But even if you are camping in the penthouse, you'll still be coming back to the spawn room pretty frequently to craft more killstreaks and self-revives. During the main quests, one of the Aether Scope parts can be found in here, and with only one of them appearing at a time, you may have to check this room up to three times for the part. And there's also that whole bit with the tank. If you want to call for exfil, it will have to be done from here. And there is a box location in here, although the mystery box isn't quite as valuable in Cold War as it was in previous games. So this isn't the most beneficial thing, but it doesn't hurt either. So I'm going to go ahead and give this spawn room a 7 out of 10. It's a pretty solid room for the majority of the match, but it's just not that good at the start. Firebase Z, in my opinion, is the peak example of a spawn room in Cold War. Immediately on round one, you are presented with multiple options. You can speak with Ravanov on the left to progress the story, you can save up some points for Quick Revive, which will already be powered, and when upgraded to tier 5, it grants you the ability to revive yourself, which creates a very nostalgic feeling. There's a wall gun in here, a magnum starting at 750 points. Not that it's a super necessary thing to purchase since you can spawn in with any gun, but it is green, which makes it slightly better than a red loadout weapon. And my personal favorite, the doors cost more than 500 points in solo. So no matter what you do in here, you will have to work at least a little bit to progress. Although for more advanced players, it is possible to skip the first door altogether. This was originally an oversight that Treyarch tried to fix, but they gave up with it when the Psy melee weapon was added, so now it's more like an easter egg. I also think that they chose the perfect spot to put the Rampage Inducer. If you're unaware, the Rampage Inducer was not added to the game until later in its life cycle, and was retroactively added to all the maps that were already out. And on Firebase Z, they put it in this little room on the upper floor of the building, which had previously contributed almost nothing to the map. Once the power is restored at the facility, some more areas down here will be unlocked, granting access to some high rarity weapons, an armor station, the Wonder Fizz, and most importantly, Pack-a-Punch, which keeps this spawn room very relevant during a match. And there's a lot of space in here too, so there's not much risk in coming here mid-round. One of the three mimics that you need to capture during the main quest can be found in here, which is a step that I really hate, but at least this one is pretty easy to find due to it being in a contained area. And the final boss fight takes place in here as well. I think that this spawn room deserves a 10 out of 10. I really just can't think of anything to criticize about it. It has so much to offer at any point during a match, and it feels like it has been adapted for all of the changes that have been made to this mode over the years. Unfortunately, Mauer der Toten's spawn room does not meet the expectations set by Firebase C. It's set on the roof of an apartment building, which has partially collapsed into the room below. Like Firebase Z, there is a green wall gun in here, a Diamati this time instead of the Magnum, which I personally like more, but most people are still going to prefer their custom loadout weapon. And of course, there's the Rampage Inducer, but other than that, there's really nothing else to it. Tombstone is in here, but unlike Firebase Z, it's not powered up at the beginning of the match, and it's not even worth coming back for later because the location of the Wonder Fizz is just so convenient that you hardly need to use the perk machines. I don't even know where Juggernaut is. And unfortunately, the price of the doors in Solo has returned to 500 points, allowing you to immediately leave. But at least in previous maps, if you opened up the first door right away, the zombies would still already be in spawn. But on Mauer, if you use the zipline, they're all going to respawn in the next building. So this one's only going to get a 1 out of 10. It's very forgettable and has almost no significance to the map. The only thing that makes it somewhat special is that classic tune at the start of a match. Finally, we are on the last map. There are no zombies maps after this. Forsaken puts you outside, looking towards the main facility. It's a pretty big room, but it's littered with enough cars and debris that it's not too easy to train in here. Your objective is to charge up this teleporter so that you can reach the main building, but there is a twist. At the start of the game, this spawn room functions a lot like No Man's Land from Moon, with the difficulty rising higher and higher the longer you stay in here. But unlike Moon, the rounds are actually going up. So you want to get out of here before the game gets too difficult. Not that Cold War is all that difficult to begin with, but at least it's putting some pressure on the player. 
Although I absolutely hate that Juggernaug is in the very next room, it removes any consequences there would have been for staying here too long, and there are actually reasons that make it worthwhile to stay here longer than you need to. Like skipping those boring early rounds without needing to use the Rampage Inducer. Or you could use the Rampage Inducer to skip them even faster. But mainly to buy Death Perception. With its ability to increase the amount of salvage you earn, it's easily one of the best perks in Cold War, so it's very tempting to get it early for a head start on your progression. You could even take advantage of the faster spawn rates to quickly build up some salvage, which you could immediately put to use at the crafting and armor stations. This spawn room has also got two wall guns, another Diamati, and a 1911, both still green. But if you are sticking around here for a little while, then these guns could be more beneficial to buy since you don't have access to anything else. Oh, and there's an ammo cache in here too. Actually, all the Cold War maps have one. I almost didn't realize because you so rarely need to use them. However, I rarely ever find myself returning here after I leave. It is where you exfil, and one of those big crystals can be found in here, but besides that, I don't ever feel drawn to it. And I blame the teleporters. You see, this map is supposed to be a big circuit. You start at spawn, go to Main Street, then any town, the bunker, and finally the observation tower, which should connect back with spawn. But that teleporter is on the far end of the room and kind of out of sight. And with the radiation limiting how long you can stay in here, most players are going to go for the more conveniently located zip lines. Plus, these other sections of the map are a bit easier to survive in anyway. So I'm going to give this map spawn room a 4 out of 10. I do really like its gimmick with the rounds going up at the start of the match, but I wish that Treyarch had fully committed to it and didn't just give us Juggernaug so soon. That and returning here is kind of an inconvenience because of the teleporter's poor placement. And there we have it. Every Treyarch spawn room. Every single last one. That's all of them. Look at that. Wow. Now put it in reverse order. Nice. It's too bad Black Ops 6 is about to come out and immediately ruin this. Now, based on everything that we've seen, what is a spawn room? What description can we come up with that encompasses every map from every game? We can certainly say that a spawn room is the area of the map where you spawn on round one. Confined by the borders of the map, purchasable doors ranging from 500 to 3000 points, powered doors, and or a one-way route. Zombies do need to be able to reach the room, although it is not required for them to spawn inside of it. A spawn room can have up to three wall weapons, ranging from 200 to 6,000 points, and there can be up to four perk and pack-a-punch machines, which may or may not be available for use right away. And, well, that's it. I mean, there can be just about anything in a spawn room, like traps, reward boxes, armor stations, buildables, fast travels, rampage inducers, and a whole array of map-specific features. And if you were to go by individual games, you could easily come up with a more specific definition. But for every single one, I think that's as good as it gets. Well, that's all I've got for today. But I will see you all again whenever we do the non-Treyarch sequel. Although this one took me a lot of time to make, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that. And before you go, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.